Hello, everyone. Welcome to MaxMint 2024. It's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Artem Mishenko from the University of Manchester, who will talk about machine learning driven discovery and classification of flat band materials. Uh, over to you, Artem, please. Um, is it is it better? Can people hear? Well, we can, but I don't know about that. So, okay, um, okay, it. So, should I? Vitaly's got it now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, It. And, and and actually if you wish you could right so now it should be better right and then there's a title also visible <laughs> yes <laughs> so there is this uh, recent uh, uh, progress in the ai and uh, um, machine learning which makes now approach to new materials more like industrial uh, compared to what was before so like it takes quite uh, quite some time to come up with new materials now there are a lot of techniques which uh, you can you can use to make it like really uh, really fast and the idea is that there was like lots of revolution in lots of revolution in the last uh, few hundred years starting from this um, sort of empirical empirical science and pushing it all the way to this kind of accelerated uh, uh, fast uh, fast progress in in the in the discovering new materials and the idea is that you if you want to, you want to automate like as much as possible there because the parameter space for materials is really is really large so it's actually like some i don't know Turn to the Google, to the Google, and so on. Possible con con uh, configurations. It's very hard to navigate. Otherwise, and um, there are already lots of developments. And I think, uh, in terms of uh, organic materials, it's quite uh, uh, quite well done already because there are very good rules how to uh, do the synthesis, how to automate this synthesis process, and there's also very good predictive power of the. Uh, um, of the computation, so that's very, very, con very convenient. For inorganic materials, for like inorganic crystals, it's actually pretty, pretty hard still at the moment. But there are lots of progress. And what what happens in the last maybe twenty years? There are lots of these databases of um, of materials, so mostly of, uh, inorganic now. There's some organic materials, in fact, like eighty million or something. Those materials, but for for the for inorganic materials, uh, there are, yeah, I mean, they also go to the hundreds of thousands of millions. And um, now we can we can go to the database. So usually you have like you have to log in there, and then there will be maybe 
um, 8 million materials or maybe 150,000 materials for which there are lots of properties computed and also some information is known maybe uh, were they experimentally synthesized before, what are, what are the parameters and so on. And it goes like in a really this high throughput way. There are a few really good groups uh, which are pushing forward this uh, kind of open materials science. So for example, materials project from Berkeley, you can download everything from there. They, they provide APIs. You can then write a Python code and then get all the database uh, and kind of really there's some other databases you would need to request from the APIs, then they might send you a code and so on so to, to get to get some of these uh, details and so on. But then what you do is, uh, because, okay, now you have 100,000 materials or a million of materials. How, how do you find which one is the next, uh, I don't know, next silicon or next graphene? That's not uh, not very obvious. And then so we, we try to contribute to this field to just pick one, um, one particular uh, area and then try to explore um, Try to explore it. Uh, that's uh, that's the textbook stuff. I just want to explain the the context of what uh, what we're doing. So in the um, in the materials, so what what happens when you put more than more than few atoms more than few atoms together? So let's say if you have a, a ground state, maybe an excited state, or a different uh, electronic state of a single of individual atoms, when you put them together. They will hybridize and they form the binding anti binding states so or form the, the, because of the tunneling, they will form the overlap and then there will be a split in the energies, right? So they will form uh, based on how many you put, maybe you put like 12 atoms together. So they will form like an, uh, 12 sub, sub levels, something like that, in a molecule, for example. And then um, the closer you bring them, the, the bigger will be the separation. There's a bigger overlap of the wave functions that would then result in the bigger spread on the on those uh, energy levels. And then, if you now have a macroscopic many atoms together, like in a crystal of copper or silicon, you will have 10 to the power of 20 atoms. Uh, the the distances between those individual levels are so small that you can consider them continuous. And the separation would be in terms of KBT, like 10 to the minus 10 or something, 10 to the minus. Eight. It's a very, very small separation. And uh, those things you call them uh, energy bonds, right? Uh, there will be like a, a levels where the electrons can see. This is on the energy scale. So this energy scale, and there will be some bonds there. But there's another parameter in the crystal. So if it's a periodic structure, then you can actually arrange the way uh, the, the wave functions uh, have a phase. The way they are arranged inside the, the periodic lattice, they can be also you know, different. So, for example, here, uh, if the distance between the atoms is uh, a, then in the reciprocal space you can go from minus pi over a to pi over a, and then depending on your phase of the wave function sitting on each of those uh, individual atoms in the one-dimensional chain, you can then assign a number like along this one. So they will be if they all equally equal phase, they will be zero. Uh, of this uh, reciprocal space parameter. And here, if, uh, at pi over a, it's in a complete out, uh, out of phase, anti-phase, right? And then the whole combinations in between, you can form like a wave solution. So it's a Fourier transform of all these uh, possible combinations. And that gives you another parameter. So now in addition to energy, you also have this parameter, this uh, momentum, they call it crystal momentum or pseudo momentum, which, uh, basically tells you how the wave functions are organized inside this big bulk crystal. In a 2D, you can then have more arrangements, right? You can have uh, X and Y coordinates, and then you can say if they all, let's say, sync, so they all aligned. Uh, this is a, an example of like more complicated orbital just to visualize better. This is like a pi orbital. This is uh, like a dumbbell shape, and you can say, okay, there will be plus of the wave function on the left side and the minus on the right side. And then if they all sync with each other, if they all nicely arranged, then you will have uh, this zero zero coordinate. And then you can have some of them in phase, some of them out of phase, depending if it's on the x or y axis, or if then both there, you can basically map the entire space. Then in the 3D, it's very hard to plot, so I didn't plot it here. In the 3D, you have all kinds of this three three dimensional space. And then the all this all this um, all this momentum is actually only important within this uh, lattice unit cell. So plus or minus uh, pi over a, uh, ax, a, y, a, z, and so on. And then in, uh, um, 
in the reciprocal space, it will be represented as this so-called brilliant zone, where you have this kind of a, a special special um, polyhedron. And inside that one, you can identify a reducible representation, a very small subset where the you, know, you cannot you cannot uh, uh, make it smaller than that, and all other bits of this uh, uh, of, of this uh, brilliant zone you can generate by by the by the uh, unit cell vectors, and and they usually use some letters. Yeah. So like a gamma is in the middle, zero 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 coordinate. Then if it's like uh, L is like slightly higher than the K is at the, at the vertices and so on. May I ask a question? Uh, so this is for a uh, single item or uh, cluster like uh, so on, on what level uh, this is uh, electrons? And, uh, so this is uh, a periodic, um, a three-dimensional periodic lattice of atoms. Okay. So they are rigid in a, in a yeah. periodic lattice, and and then of course you can have more than one atom inside the unit cell. They can yeah. be like in graphene, for example. There will be two carbon atoms. They are they are not um, not identical, and so on. Um, just just to bring the context, what are those flat, what are these ele uh, electronic bands? I think it's kind of trivial, but it's uh, sometimes useful. And then what you get usually in those databases, you will have uh, plots like this. Where they plot energy here on this scale, and then they plot this momentum, crystal momentum on the x-axis, but it's flattened. So what you have now, you take this reducible representation, and then you unfold it, and only plot your uh, how the energy behaves along these high symmetry lines. So no other information is given, although they have it. So in the database, you can have a, a, a dense grid, maybe a kx, ky, kz, and for each point, you can get maybe a value of like what's the energy eigenvalues there, what are the um, densities, and so on. So they are much more dense information. But in a database, it usually would be something like that. These kind of pictures. Yeah. This value is simulated. This is uh, calculated. Yeah, usually the, you use a density functional theory or something like that to to compute, and there's a different levels of uh, accuracy. Mm -hmm. You can do like a very very basic one. You can very quickly calculate hundreds of thousands of materials, and it's usually very very bad. So it doesn't take into account any any uh, realistic properties. So then you can improve a little bit. You can include maybe some spin structure, like spin orbit coupling. You can do slightly better. And then as soon as you try to improve a little bit, you have like tenfold increase in computational um, expand, expenditure. Mm -hmm. So it's there is a trade-off balance. And, and none of these uh, would normally cover any interactions between the electrons. It's all like a single electron picture or some effective. You can put some effective interaction. And that's... Um, but they're trying to improve. So basically, these pictures will be better and better with time. And, and they this kind of like a fingerprint of the of the material. So in addition to crystal structure, you also have this kind of thing. Um, so you see, if you compare it to molecules where you have energy levels, because it's uh, quantized in all three dimensions, a small, uh, small thing, you don't have this uh, crystal momentum there. Uh, in the crystals, you have this extra parameter, the way the wave functions are arranged. And that's quite unique. So basically, these letters, the way they are arranged, they depends on the crystal symmetry on the on the on the on a group symmetry of the, of the material. And then you can classify materials. You see, this one has a gap between the highest uh, uh, level of this uh, called valence band and the lowest uh, area of the uh, conduction band. So there is a gap here. It's called a semiconductor. It's a silicon. So there's some band gap. If there is overlap, it would be like a metal. If they're touching at one point, it's a semi-metal. If the gap is very large, it's an insulator and so on. So that's like a classification. But then for some of the materials, there is very peculiar thing happens and purely from the crystal symmetry point of view. So this is a, one of the examples. This is a cobalt, cobalt tin intermetallic compound. It has this uh, um, David Starr's arrangement. So it's kind of like hexagons and triangles arranged in this uh, in this pattern. And then what happens is that your wave function usually have, you know, this uh, anti-symmetry. So if you have a plus node, there'll be minus node and so on. They keep like going in cycle. But then here, these plus and minus nodes, they interfere destructively at each of these uh, vertices of the triangle. And that results in this uh, flat, uh, flat band. So no matter what's your crystal momentum, the energy will be always the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I have a question. And the same energy is somewhere around zero. Say again? Uh, so the energy of this, like uh, this configuration of uh, 
Parkinson's is also in life science. It's uh, it's going to be something like row zero or. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think I understood. Sorry, can, can you explain? Can you ask? So I guess so. It, it's like a, the the forces are electrostatic, right? And it's like the, the most dominating part of this. Uh, uh, this is a covalent bond. Oh. So I think this is. I mean, this is basically it's an intermetallic compound. So it's like something between the metallic bonds and the covalent bonds. So the 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 um, there will be some some electrons that will participate in forming a, a chemical bond. So they will be shared between the atoms. They form a chemical structure. But then some of the electrons, they delocalized and then spread everywhere evenly inside the material. And But those electrons, even they move freely, they still obey these rules, right? So they still obey these rules because they feel the periodic potential, periodic potential of this crystal structure. And because uh, there are some... You know, there are some rules for this, uh, how the electron moves in the periodic potential. One of the results is that it would form this, uh, this flat band. There's this, there's this uh, dispersion relation here. That's from other parts of the, of the material. So the, there are, and, the, and the zero is here for, in the energy scale. This pushed a little bit away. And, and, and this is um, this called Kagome lattice. And uh, it would always have this uh, flat band. And there are many other examples. There's also a checkerboard lattice. For example, that would have flat band to the Fermi level. So this, um, you see the, the momentum indices are different because the crystal structure is different. And there's also much less letters because it's a two-dimensional system. So you don't have the third dimension there. So uh, with flat band means that uh, it does, doesn't distinguish materials. So it's not helpful in understanding what the material structure is or what's the problem. Um, So, so why is it why is it bad to have a flat bond? It's not bad actually. Ah, it's, it's, not it's, bad. Very, it's very good. Ah, ah, it's very good. It's, it's very good. So why is it good? Uh, I'll show in a ah, second. <laughs> and there are a few more, few more examples. There's another Lieb lattice. Uh, this, and this is actually a three-dimensional representation of the of the of the band structure. So now instead of these flat uh, pictures, you can also fold it back into uh, a momentum in a 2D space. So the, the X and Y coordinates or the momentum are, are here and the vertical axis is the energy scale. So that basically, if you can look at this at this picture and this picture, they are sort of identical, right? So you see you have a flat band to the roof and then you have these uh, cones here at the K point. It's just uh, repeating like six times for, for, I don't know, for beautification purposes, probably. Um, yeah, so there are many of them. They come from this crystal structure, and uh, there is actually lots of uh, lots of interesting physics. And uh, uh, for example, there are uh, a big class of materials uh, like cuprate superconductors, iron-based superconductors, which have these flat bands and they have very high uh, temperature uh, transition temperature in the superconductivity. No one knows uh, why why, for example, this uh, called Yipko, why it has a transition temperature at 80 Kelvin or something like that. The theory for the superconductors is called BCS. That one doesn't apply to any of these materials. And uh, of course, we want to have room temperature superconductor, you know, to have a trains and whatever uh, running and, and so on. What's the, highest, what's the current record? I think uh, proven and uh, practical is some mercury-based uh, compound of the copper, uh, the copper oxide. It's hundred I think so was claimed it, but then they couldn't reproduce it. There's still huh? debate of the whether that's one that's no 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 that's 130 or 140 yeah, Kelvin. I think that's uh, that's, the, that's the that's the highest so far. Yeah, there were there were lots of papers, uh, many of them retracted now mm -hmm. by uh, but those are not really practical uh, in even if they were true, because that's at the megabar pressures. So you have a diamond anvil cell, then you squeeze the material, and then you bring the atoms so close to each other they form. Uh, like very very dense matter, and then usual BCS theory actually works, and then they can tell okay you can have room temperature superconductivity, but then you would need to apply 300 megabar to 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 keep it there. But that those are a few papers retracted at the moment, so I think that direction is not so practical. So, he, so normal pressure of um, uh, highest temperature is let's say 100. Around 100, 100. I mean 100 Kelvin is the one you can actually use. 
and people are already using it. So maglev trains or some um, leads for the NMR uh, machines and the new new superconducting magnets. They they now build in CERN. They also have lines of this Ripco is called when they make these uh, high TC superconductors. Mm -hmm. And then instead of you know like that cross section copper cable, you have like a, a tiny ribbon of whatever like hundred micron wide, which can you can pass like hundreds of amps or kilo amps of current through it. Mm -hmm. It's quite efficient. These materials, mm -hmm. technologically, I think they were discovered in the 80s. I think technologically, it's not so easy to make because it's a ceramic, mm -hmm. it's a doped ceramic, and it's very brittle, and it's very hard to make a cable of a brittle material. Mm -hmm. So the technological issues, and also they are not very uh, happy if you apply very high currents in a, a rapid succession that would then create some stress, and then they they just break. But yeah, so the physics there, no one knows why they superconduct. I mean, there are many many theories which uh, tell you why they would be superconducting, but uh, I don't think that any of them have any like prevalence. And now we have three classes of materials. Recently, they were discovered nickelates, so nickel-based nickel, nickel, uh, nickel based, uh, oxide materials, which are superconducting as well. There you need also to have high pressure, mm -hmm. uh, but they are kind of like, you have copper, iron, nickel now, so quite a lot of groups of materials for which we don't understand the physics, uh, why they are superconducting at high temperature. But they, most of them, and I think actually all of them have these flat bands. So they form a flat band. And uh, there's also some other strange materials like this, uh, uh, rhodium silicates and, and, and so on. They also form very interesting, unusual physics. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go into detail. Mm -hmm. There are some topology, strong correlations. So main, main, main ingredient, you want to have a flat band. And then in the flat band, what happens is that for any momentum, for any of these crystal index, uh, which represents how the wave functions are arranged, you will have the same energy for the electrons. So the, that means you have now lots of lots of electrons in a very narrow um, parameter space. And then they have nothing else to do. They have to interact with each other. And when they interact, they form a collective state. And this collective state usually can be like maybe a magnetism, like anti-ferromagnetic or ferromagnetic ordering. Sometimes it's superconductivity. Mm -hmm. But you want to have this uh, flat band, and then on top of that flat band, the interactions will happen, and they will drive some new physics there. So this flat band seems to be a necessary condition. Yes. It's, it's like a catalyst for the, the process, yeah. But it's an experimental conclusion without a theoretical explanation at the moment. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of um, like a deeper theory behind that. But there are some, I think there are lots of theories recently, especially we have this new uh, kind of um, a graphene 2.0, what they call it. Mm -hmm. It's a magic angle um, Moira, Moira super lattice. So you have two graphene layers, you put them on top of each other, and you misalign them by 1.05 degrees. That's why it's magic. So it has to be exactly this angle. If you are 0 0.1 degree off, it won't work. And it was predicted by theorists uh, and then realized experimentally like a decade later. So that's a very nice um, outcome for the theory group on, on, on that case. So what happens is that when you have two graphenes, they have Dirac cones, and then when you change the angle, you bring it closer and closer. So these Dirac cones, they bring closer, come closer and closer to each other in the momentum space. Mm -hmm. And that flattens their, their the cones. So they basically the, the, cone, the cone structure gets like flatter and flatter and flatter. And at this 1.05 degrees, it gets completely flat. So you get a flat band. And then in this particular system, you actually have a superconductivity. Not very high temperature, one Kelvin or something like that, but it's pure carbon, nothing else there. Mm. So that's a, a normal pressure. A normal pressure. It works quite nicely. And then it allows, you know, by changing angle to change the interaction strands and form a flat band and study the physics there. The other typical example, kind of like the first ever flat band system is the Landau levels. So if you have a two-dimensional electron gas, you can pass a magnetic field perpendicular to the surface. Then the electrons go in these cyclotron orbits, and then they kind of localize and don't move in the X and Y directions. And then by definition, there will be no dependence on this, you know, how the wave function are arranged in, this, in the space. Uh, so they become flat. And it looks like a boring system because these guys don't participate in anything. Uh, so it's nothing interesting. But because of the topology in the system, you actually have this uh, interesting um, edge state. So you can imagine like a skipping orbit, basically. This, 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 the electrons, because of Lorentz force, can only go in one direction. So they will be skipping on the edge and only go in one, in one side. And it forms this uh, conducting one-dimensional channels, uh, which conduct with exactly uh, um, E square over H uh, conductivity per channel. 
and uh, that's now an international standard for uh, resistance. So you can you can put your device in a high magnetic field, and then it will generate a resistance. You can measure with a voltmeter what's the voltage drop there. It will be exactly e square over h ohms. So it's a von Klinsen constant, uh, something like twenty five kilo ohm, something like that. And I think they replace now the standard of uh, current, the standard of resistance from this uh, Paris with a uh, with a uh, physics basically. So there are lots of connections from different materials, uh, and they have this uh, flat bands. So there are, there are some kagomis always have so flat bands, so that's kind of a classical one. But it's a little bit boring in the sense that it's very far away from the Fermi level, so that you you cannot really normally reach it with in the, in some transport measurements. So we need to find some more materials, and then also from those find which are useful, because uh, there can be again thousands of them, and uh, life is too short to measure them all. And then how do you do it? So you have, let's say, a database, a database with lots of uh, lots of materials. There's um, some guys they did it like that. So we say if it's less than fifty milli electron volts, it's flat, and uh, if it's forty nine, it's flat. If it's fifty one, it's not flat. So you can have a fuzzy criterion or something, but that looks very much artificial. And then you you say like the some of them are good, some of them are bad using some criteria, and then you select few few systems. You can be more sophisticated. It looks like more like a machine learning now. So you put uh, if else, lots of if else. If there is a gradient here, goes above some threshold and so on. So you can basically build the constructs there to 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 do the selection of materials. Once again, looks very much biased and um, requires lots of um, uh, details. So it would be nice to use some you know, generic generic approach. We can then maybe extend to some other systems there. So that's what we did last year. Uh, we we actually just used a, a simple um, convolutional neural network to, to get these uh, flat band materials and then use some other unsupervised clustering to classify them into some sort of a, a picture so a human researcher can understand out of uh, tens of thousands of materials. We take a database. I think there was 2D Matpedia, which was the only one where you can freely download and 2D material. So we just pick that one. And then it has this um, lots of uh, those um, band structures. You can download them. And then you you clean clean the image a little bit. So you throw away all the access, all these things, so they don't uh, contaminate you know, the, uh, uh, the machine learning and make them grayscale or black and white. And then you you segment the image, and that's kind of a nice uh, trick. You can uh, cut it on a small sub-images, and then even very basic uh, AI can do the job. We we actually did some, um, I think just 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 the multi-layer perceptron worked actually, but uh, referee said no 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 you have to use something more advanced. So we put we put a convolutional neural network and change the title to deep learning. So they they were very happy with that, and that actually it works better I think um, this way. It's uh, much less much less training is needed. Some some basic one works. And you train it, so there's a human researcher who is doing the training, and then we try it with few, like PhD students and postdocs. Postdocs look looks like they train better than PhD students because they can tell, oh, looks like flat band, looks like not so flat band. So there is still bias, and we're still working on how to make it less biased. And then we did another simplification after that. We, we put um, sort of a constraint. We looked at the, at the material there. If it's flat, then we integrate integrate that that picture here so we integrate this this picture along this axis so to get kind of like how many of those bands are available it's kind of density of states and the one which picks we then look at what atoms they project and then we only select those atoms so we create a sub lattice of the lattice of a material we remove throw away a lot of atoms and then we consider this is our flat band sub lattice and then we do classification on those on those sub lattices and uh, to classify them, we use the structure fingerprint. That's another uh, somewhat biased uh, technique, but that's uh, accepted. So in, the, for example, in materials project, if you want to compare two materials, let's say you pick a material one and you want to find who is the nearest, uh, most similar material to it. And then you do it by um, applying a so-called the structure fingerprint, which is arbitrary design. So some some researchers, they, they, they were sitting there and decide, okay, let's use maybe this symmetry criteria, maybe these kind of parameters and, and so on. And then based on the values you compute for each of your uh, crystals, you can then get a, 
multi-dimensional vector, maybe like 244 dimensions, I think is, uh, and then you measure the Euclidean distance between the points in that, um, in that space. Uh, you, you can use maybe Minkowski metric, I think, because it's a high, high dimensional, but yeah. And then we use some clustering based on this, uh, on this metric to, to cluster the materials. And it's a very nice uh, uh, this density based, uh, hierarchical density based uh, clustering, which is, uh, works really well if your clusters are not uh, elliptical. So it's a pretty, and also it gives you a hierarchy as a bonus. And then you can use this Tisney, um, the basically a two dimensional representation of your multi dimensional space just to show people what, what, what we got. That's the, just a, an example of how this uh, um, how this sublattice was was generated. So, for example, if you identify a material which has the three different atoms like phosphorus, palladium, and sulfur, we then check okay, that's a flat band, and then who is picking? I think this a palladium has a higher density than sulfur, so we say it's a palladium sublattice. So you basically throw away phosphorus and sulfur, and then look what is the sublattice of palladium, and it turns out it's a cadmium. Uh, it's a kind of, um, but we didn't know there was no a priori knowledge when we when we took those uh, those band structures and find them as a flat band materials, and then we we call it a conjecture. We don't know if it's true or not. There is a paper in in parallel. Actually, they submitted I think earlier than us. They published later uh, in a three dimensional space, uh, uh, and they also did this kind of uh, sublattice separation. So it seems to be quite a reasonable approach. Although I think there might be some interesting exceptions from from this uh, from this case. And then yeah, you generate basically this kind of uh, representation. This one is sort of evolution tree, which tells you by how far are those points, how similar are the clusters of materials uh, based on their structural similarities. So like these three clusters, for example, they are very similar structurally. They form this kind of a group, and also in this TSNE representation, they also close. Each other, they form this kind of um, island. Lots of materials remain unclassified, so basically they unclustered. It. So it's like more than half. Like maybe um, two thirds of materials don't form any clusters. And I think that's actually okay because we want to find some some interesting trends, not to classify all the materials there. And also the clusters, of course, they're fuzzy. You don't have any like real physical reason to you know. To, to firmly classify materials in the different groups. I think there are connections between those clusters. It's like evolution tree, basically. And we even find some um, overall principles. So for example, there will be some four-fold symmetry or six-fold symmetry and so on. And then they slowly evolve by losing more and more symmetries, for example, or getting more and more symmetric as you go in this, uh, in this representation. And I think this approach works quite well on the relatively small sized materials databases. I have uh, like last slide at the at the end of the talk where we did it on a, a large database. I'll show you how how messy it looks and then what's the what what can we do to to improve it. But it's a nice a nice approach to to classify materials which have flat bands and then to to study some of the some of them in more detail. Next one, what we wanted to do is to actually classify materials based on the electronic structures, not on the crystal structures, to use this, the band structure images as the means of classifying materials. But there are no fingerprints. So we need to find some machine learnable representation of electronic band structure, those ones I was showing, uh, this uh, x-axis are those high symmetry points in the momentum space and the vertical axis is the energy scale. There are some approaches, like some groups in, in Denmark, they. They, they try to come up with some sort of density-based representation of those electronic bands. Um, they're a little bit tricky to use and we don't have access to the entire um, entire results of the, of the density functional theory. We only have this band structure. So we need to come up with something. Uh, and, and then I, I had some few ideas. I asked students to try to, oh, we do this, we do that, like some clever ways. And then, and then they found much better way and much simpler as well. So they said, why don't we use autoencoder for that? So we, and then they use the image of a, of a database, image of a band structure, and use a very simple convolutional autoencoder. I think it's not even state of the art. It's like ResNet 18 or something like that. And you basically train it on all these materials and all the flat band materials. It works not just on flat band, it works on all the materials, but we are working on flat band. 
Um, so you train them, and the, the way this autoencoder works, it, it actually generates some sort of condensed latent space representation of these of this image. Then it decodes it back, and then generates the output, and then you compare your original image with the with the output, and that's your training. Basically, then you do lots of training, and you then make um, this uh, fingerprint would be a flattened representation of the latent space there. I think we use like sixty four dimensional or something like that. And that's a uh, very nice uh, works very nicely from the system there. And then you can do the same as what we did for the previous work, but now we classify based on these pictures of the band structures, and it works amazingly. So it actually classifies bands um, nicely in the, into the cluster. So for example, there will be some small gap semiconductors, some some relatively narrow flat band systems, larger band gap semiconductors with complicated structures grouped together. So completely unsupervised so you don't put any input there you don't tell how to classify and then if you look in the groups actually you can even see some uh, commonality in the chemistry which wasn't there you only give them these images of the band structures don't tell what is the material and they can tell okay this uh, looks like some intermetallic compounds this is a selenite this is a uh, alloys with this uh, arsenic bismuth kind of uh, column in the periodic table so classic and the band structures also look very nicely uh, similar to each other with so pixel on all, all kinds of uh, features there and this is like an example of how do you cross map so this is um uh, the fingerprints are from the electronic band structure but these colored dots are from the previous work we we did on this um, structural fingerprint so they even identify that some of the similar structures give you similar uh, flat bands uh, uh, which is, uh, which is reasonable. You can also use this uh, uh, for generative applications now, because we have uh, now this latent space representation, you have the 64 parameters. You can take one of them and you can start slowly changing the value and it would generate a new material with uh, whatever uh, band structure. And it's kind of, you can see like the gap, for example, there is there was a band here, then it kind of moves, disappears, gap uh, opens or gap closes here. And so on. So you can basically go smoothly through the parameter space. Now, I don't know if we can then do the inverse problem. Can we then find out a material which can represent this, this, uh, this flat band? I don't know. Um, probably not. Mm -hmm. So, and I think this kind of like a nice, uh, nice technique because it gives you a pipeline of uh, fully unsupervised. So you start from a subset of materials. Then you can generate a fingerprint, generate the um, clustering of those of those materials, and then so the next step, of course, is to then look what's inside those clusters and then write a paper. I think you can use ChatGPT for that to, to close to close the cycle. Um, as I have actually just one slide left, so I think I'm right on time. So the next step is three databases because it's very simple. The pipeline is, uh, you can easily expand it to other databases. We use the materials project, which is 200 something, 100, 120,000 materials with good band structures calculated. And then you do the same. And then what you get is something like that. <laughs> and then you look at it, what do, what do we do with it? There's no way, no way human researcher can analyze it. The previous pictures was fine, we actually, went through them point by point is 50 clusters. You spend a couple of weeks looking through them and finding some interesting materials to make. But here it's impossible. So you need the next step. Maybe automate that analysis. We are trying to use some fine-tuned LLMs or, or, or maybe some small language models to basically train them on how you describe a smaller subset uh, clusters and then ask them to write something. But it's most of the time it's really gibberish. And uh, that that's probably that's a problem of LLMs at, at the moment. I think they, they lack logic. They, they lack uh, uh, very much. They lack uh, logic and reasoning. But that will be improved, I think, within a year. So we might use that. The other way do is to do some data reduction. And one one of the good ideas probably we are trying to explore now is to find some sort of non-triviality metric, because in those flat bands, so not all of them are interesting. So for example, you can imagine if your crystal. The, the atoms which are responsible for the flat band, if they're very far away from each other, so they're held by some other atoms, but they don't form flat bands. But the atoms which are responsible for the flat band, they're very far away from each other. Then the overlap of those wave functions of those two atoms, they will be very weak. And if they're not overlapping much, there will be no much dispersion. So they will be flat band, 
but it's like a trivial atomic insulator. So there is no much interesting physics is expected. So you would want to maybe throw away those materials. And if you do it, you actually end up with maybe like, again, two, 3,000 materials, and then it's more manageable. But it's not so trivial to come up with a, a criteria how to, again, how to find the... Purpose of this far away atoms. Mm -hmm. uh, can you estimate um, in, in numbers of neighbors? So is it, say, neighbor number 10 or 20 in your experience? I think it's uh, I think it's not um, it's not just mathematics there, and we we try we try the purely mathematical approach. Um, I think you you need some information from the database. So what we come up with is we used the uh, the electronic density, and then we see how fast the electronic density falls on the path between the atoms. And then yes, then we use this kind of a graph, um, you know, pathfinder to find like minimal spanning tree, for example, and then you look. Um, your your like your measure there would be maybe the fall fall off of the electronic density in between, mm -hmm. so and then you then classify them on what's the some I don't know what's the magnitude of this uh, parameter in the minimum spanning tree or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of neighbors, I think you have to you have to span the entire uh, unit cell, and you can do like maybe two by two by two or three by three by three, you know, to have more. Uh, as to have better connectivity there, mm -hmm. um, be because you can come, you can have, you know, uh, uh, what can happen in some peculiar cases. You maybe have like cluster of like two atoms close to each other, and then then two other uh, again, but they're far away. But then how do you measure? It's still not good because these these two guys close, these two guys are close, but the distance, total distance between them is too large. They still will be atomic insulator, just form a dimer. So, mm -hmm. but but yeah, I think this is an an open 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 question for for research. So that would that would help probably to navigate this space and to find the next, I don't know, next graphene or next room temperature. First room temperature superconductor. That's it. And so collaborators, this is from different conference. So I put lots of um, people with whom I collaborate. This, uh, what we are doing now on this uh, machine learning is quite a small, small part of the of the group, uh, but it's quite exciting. I'm, I'm very happy with this direction. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much, Artyom. <laughs> I'll stop the recording.